but we're living in a in a, a psychological prison where we're surrounded by psychopaths. So you have to do something. It, you know, it, we're not playing on a play on a fair field. So it doesn't make sense for me to allow the zombies to multiply. <laughs> From Alcapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to the Conspiracy Edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. We have a lot of conspiracy stuff on this channel, but uh, we're going to have definitely some more today. And actually, I did not know this person until probably like two days ago, or maybe yesterday, it was that soon, a friend forwarded me an article, and the article was up on his website at jtrue.com, and the article was just called Behold a Pale Horse's Ass, and he was talking about how great Bill Cooper was. If you don't know Bill Cooper, very interesting. He was killed right after 9-11, after he basically said they were going to do 9-11 and, and blame it on Osama bin Laden. He was killed right after 9-11, and uh, he was talking about how uh, Alex Jones is basically not Bill Cooper. He's basically uh, uh, what you call a shill or controlled opposition and that sort of a thing. I don't have exact opinion on it, but as, a, as I was reading the article, I was like, man, this guy's on the same page as me on so many things. And then I noticed on the right-hand side, it said uh, he has a, a couple books, uh, and one of the books is called Blueprints of Mind Control. And I've been really gravitating to this idea that the way that these people are controlling the world today is mostly through mind control. It's something I've really been figuring out over the last year or so, essentially hypnosis and mind control. And uh, uh, so when I saw he wrote about that. I contacted him, and it turns out he knows uh, myself, and he knows the show, and uh, and we got talking, and we seem really on the same page, and that's basically where it stops. I don't know much more about him. I haven't read the book yet, because I just found out about it, but it sounds like we're really on the, uh, a lot of the same pages, so I really wanted to have him on. His name is James True, uh, coming in from, I, th I believe, the Appalachians or something like that, wherever that is. <laughs> I actually don't even know where that is. Uh, you have to <laughs> Google it, but maybe you can tell me, James. Uh, I know it's somewhere in the U.S., uh, and and uh, yeah, real pleasure to have you on. And before we get started, I have to ask you, how did you become an anarchist? Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. And uh, I, am, I will not call myself an anarchist because I want something close to what we call anarchy right now. I call myself a bioregionalist. I think it has a, a higher quality uh, stay in the other person's mind. Um, and I've been a bioregionalist now since... Probably 1998, uh, I used to be involved in Earth First. Uh, and was petitioning FOIA requests for the National Forest Service. I was pretty upset about how our forests are kept under the Department of Agriculture as if they were a crop. And that's really when I first started to notice uh, the problems of, of the pyramid government and what happens from that. So from that, I developed myself into a bioregionalist, which uh, is not my own term, but it is a pretty obscure term that I sadly I, I, I wish more people knew about. But it's a great opportunity for me to take that and uh, spread the word, like Johnny Appleseed. Yeah, and uh, as we got talking, and I asked you if you were an anarchist, and that was your answer. It's it's basically you said you are, but you uh, prefer much prefer this term called bioregionalist. And I asked you what the heck's that term? I never heard that before. And you sent me a few things on it, and it sounds really interesting. And I asked you, uh, it's kind of complex uh, it's from what I, I looked at. Uh, yeah, I just briefly looked at it, but maybe you can explain what what that term means. Sure. Um, it, any anarchist listening to this is going to be like, well, duh, that's, that's what I am. Um, <laughs> it's basically turning coercive government into compassion-based government. Uh, the, the things that you get out of squeezing someone are going to be a much different kind of oil than if you were to get out of uh, letting something blossom and uh, uh, coming by and saying, hey, do you want to contribute to this grand soup that we're making here? So uh, it's ch changing, transmuting the energy of coercive government into compassion-based government. Uh, th that's really at the heart of it. And the key to that is to find every pyramid that you can find and absolutely destroy it, uh, especially anything with three letters. Um, that's <laughs> typically going to be something that's going to be right up there at the top of the list. But it's to relearn the fact that any time we get into a chain of command situation, and I'm going to use the word satanic, but I, I really want people to understand what I mean by that word. This, I'm not talking about a devil here. I'm talking about a system, a, a machine of a vacuous machine that abandons uh, all hope, ye who enter here. And it's doing that under the guise of compassion, but it's a blind compassion, a blind empathy, I should say, which means that none of us are actually helping our brethren. Instead, we are being coerced into slavery. Uh, the, it's Imagine a yoke, a, a heavy ox yoke dipped in solid gold, 
and then placed on you and being told, look how great this yoke is. It's so great. You should, you should be happy. Why, why are you complaining about it? And it's basically just finding that every inch, every, every part you can find that in and saying no to it, saying this is wrong. This is a coercive form of government. Uh, but so, you know, again, it's very close to, to anarchism. Yeah, and as I asked you, um, you I, I, I kind of looked at a few things that you sent me, and I said, well, is there a taxation? Because that's a real big part of government. Yeah. And you said no. And I said, okay, so it's not really government, so to speak. Not the government that we know today, anyway. Um, and, and you say bio, what, what's called bioregionalism? Is that what so, yeah, let, let me just go into it more. I just wanted to first build that scaffolding so everyone understands that I'm actually talking about the same thing. But I believe if you present it this way, it's going to be sold in a much more effective, it's going to be received in a lot, uh, a lot more communities without there being such a resistance to it. Mm. And to me, that's the key, is I, I want something that's going to be received by people. So by a region, I'm in the state of North Carolina. Um, I live in the high country of North Carolina. So I live in the mountains of Appalachia. Um, I, I actually live in the highest elevated town east of the Mississippi. We, we have a heavy ski industry. We're very much into cold weather. Um, but that's just one part of North Carolina. North Carolina really has three bioregions. Uh, in the center, you've got a lot of flat land. You've got a lot of uh, farming. A lot of tobacco is grown here. And then if you go to the east coast, you've got this ancient pirate history, <laughs> wetlands kind of stuff that's going on where it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, just a completely different environment. So you have three different environments competing for the same resources within the state of North Carolina. What ends up happening is, is all of their needs are muted to make everyone else happy. And so you end up blurring and, and basically destroying the, the state. With bioregionalism, uh, we would redefine what we call a state uh, and turn it more into the bioregion. It would be very much of a natural thing that would develop. Uh, each bioregion would choose uh, you know, each community, I should say, would choose which bioregion they want to be a part of. And by doing so, they're all combining their resources and their talents, and they're protecting what's most important to them, uh, which would be completely different if you're living in a situation where you want a wintertime recreation area versus if you want to grow uh, tobacco uh, in the flatlands. So it, it redefines the, all the priorities. And more importantly, it stops the pyramid taxation in which we're, we're playing this game of Plinko where we're taking 40% of our labor. Um, we are sharecroppers for our time in America right now. It's not a, even a taxation. It's literally, we only have so many hours in the day. And those hours, every Monday and Tuesday, we're required to get up and serve, pay labor to uh, a corporation. That this is violence. This is not how you would run things. And that's why you can't really have taxation. But you want you want a system. You want something there that people can rely on, that they can build on. You want a structure like a, a tree or a bush or anything else like that. And because of that, uh, we can turn off the top pyramid and turn everything into a bioregionalistic approach. And by doing that, all of your money, all your tribute, all of your contributions that you're making um, are going directly into the local environment. And by doing that, you're able to percolate uh, up. And just as Tennessee a long time ago was, no, it still is, but a long time ago, Tennessee got the name the Volunteer State because back in the Confederacy, Tennessee, above all the others, sent more troops. They had mustered more militia. That's what bioregionalism needs to be. We have our own militia. We decide if you want to throw a war in Iraq, the high country of North Carolina is only sending you three soldiers. And those three soldiers, um, you know, they really like that, but no one else believes in this idea. Hey, let's go, let's go raid some tombs in Iraq and call it weapons of mass destruction. It, it all this bypasses the need of uh, war powers. It, it changes the entire dynamic of what makes a nation. It turns it again from uh, coercive down to uh, compassion. Very interesting. It's a different way of describing uh, some things that I've heard about definitely in the past. A lot of anarchists have talked about the importance of decentralization. So right now we have 200 odd countries in the world. Many of us say we wish there was 2,000. We wish then there was 20,000. We wish then there was 200,000. And eventually there'll be 7 billion is kind of what we'd like to see. But um, it's really about 
uh, localizing uh, people's involvement with their communities and things like that. And I think this really, I think you have a, a point there when you say that uh, it's a different way of describing it, but it's it's important in how we describe it so that people don't get too scared. If we go, uh, we want anarchy, and if they think that means throwing bombs and stuff, we're not going to get very far. But if what we're, we're trying to say is, you know, why don't you just forget about the federal government, forget about your state, why don't you just care about your community and take care of your community all voluntarily, uh, it'll all be so much better. And even look at statism, it's kind of falling apart anyway, this right versus left. I've said this for a while, it's like, it's about 50-50 in the U.S. Whenever you look at the elections, it's almost always 49% to 51%. Yeah. They actually, I think, do it on purpose. They like try to get the propaganda just right, so it's almost 50-50 every time. Yeah. And I'm like, why don't these left people all move to one area, and why don't these right guys all move to one area, and that's it. You guys just split up. Why are you always just constantly fighting with each other? Why not just do that? And uh, it's actually getting a lot of traction with a lot of people. A lot of people are saying, yeah, why don't we do so? This is stupid. <laughs> We're just constantly fighting yeah. over the same pot uh, and and it doesn't work uh, so why not get it down to like you know uh, more communities and and doing it by by the uh, the region and what that region does makes a, a ton of sense of course as well so uh, very interesting theory who uh, you said this theory isn't something you made up is this uh, do you know who made this theory up I hadn't heard of it before I would call it like a morphic resonance that's just been happening for decades um, I, I I don't know where I first heard that word um, I used to publish a uh, environmental magazine for another group, and uh, that was a word that was floating around the office. I, I, I really couldn't even tell you, you know, where it came from. Hmm. But it, it imagine instead of having one EPA that gets to grant Monsanto, you know, carte blanche to do whatever they want, because the EPA is not a protection agency; it's, it's a racketeering agency. It, it gives you a free pass. Imagine instead of that model where uh, Monsanto would, would be facing legal litigation from every single bioregion throughout the entire world. If Monsanto wants to bring a product into the flatlands of North Carolina, well, that bioregion is pretty picky. They, you know, they, they're not gonna want certain things. You're gonna hear weird things start to come up. We're gonna start to turn into these really beautiful ideas of, of governance. I'm using that word still because I, I need to keep anarchists on board with everyone else here. We st I still want us to have a central bill of rights, even though I we could have a long conversation now about how rights are a myth and how they're part of mind control. I still want the entire population to understand that we could still unite under a centralized, you know, like just 10 bills. Like imagine if you could put everything on a flag, you get to call that something. And so as long as everything could be written on a flag that you could read, uh, you could imagine a, a, a confederacy of bioregions that have decided, hey, here are our non-aggressive principles written out, and we're calling them the Bill of Rights because that archetype has a lot of power in our history. We can still have a sense of patriotism, but now the patriotism means something because now it's not coerced. It's, it's, it's emulate, it's given, it's imbued, and that changes the entire energy of everything. If we don't, if we don't have some sort of central spoke, uh, all of our bioregions would be prone to attack or invasion, and that would make some people super nervous. Um, we want to satisfy everyone's needs, and that's why if we had this centralized uh, sort of banner that all the bioregions could come around, it, it's again more symbolic. It's more archetypal. Whenever, if there's a war, there's actually no such thing as war because from now on, it would be like you know there would be a crazy guy from Alabama. I'm, I'm just picking on them because they're my friends and I live close to them, but he could come in and say, "I want to invade Mexico," and what you have is you have a, a clustering system that's put into place that decides that this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. No, we're not going to do that. It's no longer this top-down policy. It's policies that are popping up all over the country like really brilliant ideas that no one's ever tried before. Uh, <clears throat> things like local coin, where you got like a localized token that you could only spend within 100 miles. If someone was to develop something like that, it would uh, imbue that certain area with a power that people would, would flock to. The, the exact same way where if, if Stone Mountain, Georgia was to decide, hey, we really believe in white supremacy, uh, allow that system to try like, watch what happens when that system is allowed to uh, express itself. You're going to find, just like what happened before the Jim Crow laws, these things weren't working. This was killing towns to be prejudicial. Why? Because it's affecting capitalism. It's changing the commerce of how things are. They definitely want to have a good NBA team, that's for sure. 
<laughs> if you allow our bioregions <laughs> to experiment and fail, we end up with a with a really uh, just like a an immune system, you know, inside the body. Let it try all these different things. You're going to find that that as long as it's free, it's going to operate in a symbiotic way that's that's healthy and growing. Yeah, from the anarchist pers perspective, that's a lot of what we talk about is let's just, tr you know, have a lot smaller areas and let people try whatever they want. So, you know, the communists all go to this little area and it'd be a disaster and they'll be starving. Yeah, and they'll be, exactly. they'll be near a very capitalist area and the capitalists will donate money to them so they stay alive or whatever. Actually, it would be even <laughs> different. I, like, you could imagine that there would be one bioregion would be like sending uh, tours through the communist section <laughs> to be like, look how shitty this well, idea is. You know? Look at this. Yeah. Do you believe they're doing exactly. this? They're eating so, like rats. Oh my God. Why would yeah, they do allow, that to themselves? Allow everyone to <laughs> embrace the term supremacy again. Hmm. It, it's, it's, it's funny how that word is shamed so strongly, but a supremacy is the mastery of self. And when you have a pyramid system, a satanic system, you're completely uh, subverting that. You're actually saying, no, you, you are not allowed to master yourself. We need another master outside of you. And that's really why it's slavery. And that's exactly why the mind control works. This is why I wrote my book, because they attack supremacy. They mm. attack the word prejudice. If you analyze what the word prejudice means, prejudice really means free will. I have a prejudice to wearing blue socks today. I have a prejudice to, uh, you know, making sure my beard is shaved for this interview. I, I chose this shirt. All of these are prejudices that really define my free will. But here we have a culture outside that say prejudice is bad. Prejudice is where evil comes from. Supremacy is bad. Supremacy is where evil comes from. What you're looking at is the same systematic attack on the supremacy of self on the right to have free will, to express your free will. That's what the entire government's all about. It's suppressing that notion and harnessing that power. Yeah, very interesting. And you brought up sat Satanism, uh, and you've mentioned a few times how the they have a pyramid and everything's so upside down from sort of the way it would be naturally. So they're trying to just uh, totally, uh, you know, flip everything upside down. It's kind of interesting. I'm no Bible scholar or anything, but I, I think it said somewhere in there that uh, Satan is going to, uh, you know, flip everything upside down. I, I'm paraphrasing, uh, and everything will be a lie. And that's basically where we live today. So I don't know if they were they knew about this before or if this has always been going on or or whatever uh, but it's very interesting and and let's get to your book because you, you we've talked about uh, bio uh, uh, regionalism I've gotta get used to that word I've never heard it before it's interesting though uh, but but uh, I think the reason that you've gotten here is because you've understood now what the governments we have in the world today really are and I haven't read your book yet but I have a, a feeling I, I know a bit of what you're gonna say about it that it, it's really absolutely terrible and horrible so where did you like, you know, give, give us a bit of your background. So were you just a normal person like five, ten years ago and then you started to figure this stuff out and, and research it? Or yeah. have you been into this stuff for a long time? Um, I, I've actually sort of been into this stuff for a long time, but but not married, not as strong as I have been lately. I've, I've been a computer programmer for about 15, 20 years, um, self-employed. Um, and I, I've dabbled in blockchain. I've mostly just dabbled in uh autism, virtual reality, uh, just anything interesting as far as software goes. And then uh, um, I had, <laughs> I married someone that was really mean to me. And, and, and I only say that because what I mean is, is that the trauma of when you go through life, uh, something happens and then you start to notice that the community around you is not what you thought it was. Um, uh, a truth will come up and, and I noticed that a truth came up and, and it wasn't because it was uncomfortable, other people in society weren't willing to embrace it or to say it. They instead were keeping their horse blinders on and just looking straight ahead. And that feeling caused a massive like self-abandonment inside myself. It hurt. I, I, I noticed that the friends I had weren't, weren't really friends. It was more about, no, we're just dudes that all hang out and agree on the same rules. You know, that's what we are. And, it, and I'm not even personally talking about my friends. I'm saying this is just what happens with society. We decide what's acceptable, not what's right. Those two things are completely different. And under mind control, you don't know that. Under mind control, you're under the impression those are the same things. Mm. And this is part of why we abandon our supremacy. We abandon the effort that it takes to discern and look into a truth and see what it's right. 
Uh, this just happened last summer with the, the glassy Ford, the Dr. Ford, the Stanford uh, lady that was attacking the uh, nominee for the Supreme Court. Um, I, I'm not trying to get involved in politics, but if you track that story, you understand what was happening. It was a false allegation that was coming up, but that false allegation was used like a wrestling match uh, to basically invigorate the crowd. Um, w w what we call countries aren't really countries. Uh, what we think are countries are myths. Um, and the closest example I can give to that is the wrestling match. Um, right now, you've got a Hulk Hogan. You've got a, the archetype of the orange lion, Donald Trump. He's the same archetype as like Jupiter, who would paint his face red. It's really interesting uh, how the archetype is just still there. But in one corner, you have uh, Donald Trump, the Hulk Hogan figure. He's uh, brash, he's, you know, he's bold, he's colorful, and he's attention-seeking. You, you're fascinated by Hulk Hogan. And in the other corner, you have you know, Donnie Darko, the, the black Arab sand evil, you know, all the negative things you can try and throw together in one word, you're gonna put that into this other character, and you're gonna call him your Darth Vader, and he's gonna be in the other corner. And now you have a wrestling match. If, if, if you didn't have this dichotomy, Imagine going to a wrestling match and it's Steve, the plumber, versus John, the roofer. Like, it's, you're not going to feel that same sense of, of, of polarization. So polarization is actually the key to mind control. If you didn't have polarization, you wouldn't have mind control. Because mind control is based on two, two principles, which is the, cr the crook and the flail. If you look back in Egyptian culture... Um, whenever you see a pharaoh buried, he's got a flail in one hand and a crook in the other. So this crook, the shepherd's crook, is like a gentle way of pulling someone towards you. This is the energy of fame. This is the energy of virtue. If you've heard terms like virtue signaling, this is what this is all about. You're, you're offering a vortex where someone can feed. You're saying, hey, here's some free raw meat. All you have to do is come over here and express how racist you are, express how ignorant you are, express how all, it's a, a self-flogging in public. And when you're flogging yourself in public and you're getting credit for it, you have an insane society. <laughs> you have a society that is paying people to flog themselves. But this is how mind control works. It's using fame and shame and it's intermixing the two and it's causing a corral effect very similar to a horse that has horse blinders on. The horse thinks it sees the entire world, but the truth of the matter is the horse can really only choose the left lane or the right lane. It's really the only, in fact, it, it, unless you put a division down the middle, it's not gonna know it even has a choice. But the moment you put that there, it does. And that's what carries us through. That's what puts us on the, the track, the Circus Maximus from old Rome, where all we're doing is watching the chariots go around. And all of us are hypnotized like babies watching a mobile or watching someone dangling keys. It's the key to mind control. Very interesting. I have a feeling uh, I'm going to love your book. This is exactly the kind of stuff I've been looking into. Um, just off the top of my head, though, or I'm just curious, uh, do you know the work of Mark Passio? Oh, of course, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. It seems to like skirt many areas that he talks about, but you're coming about it on a different angle that I haven't quite heard before, which uh, is great. And this is like, the, that's why I said, as soon as I read your article and I saw your book, I'm like, I have to talk to this guy. I think I think you've, you're like right where I'm just about right now, because I've been talking so much, especially in the last year. I just bring it up. I'm like, you're all hypnotized. You're all mind yeah. controlled. You're all mind controlled slaves. And people yeah. are like, oh, you're just, you're exaggerating. It's like, no, <laughs> that's exactly what yeah. you are. And, and it's then, worse. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say it's like uh, that's what they are. But I don't understand all the ways that they do it. Like I, obviously television programming, that's like just obvious. And actually, I talked to a hypnotist once and he's like, oh, that, everything that you see on there is all hypnosis. Uh, the way that they move their like Donald Trump, for example, everything he does, it's exactly what a hip hypnotist would do. You use the same symbol over and over. Mm -hmm. You're basically just hypnotizing people and saying certain words over and over. Uh, but there's there's like way more to it and and why they do it and where this all came from. And I think this is where I think you've got uh, a lot more information that I'm aware of. So basically can uh, carry on if you have more to say about this because well, it's very fascinating it, to me. The hardest part to, I think the hardest part to realize is when you first start to notice that there's mind control, 
you're going to have a tendency to think that you're woke now. Mm. You're going to have a tendency to believe that you've got it all figured out. And it's a constant awakening process. It literally has to occur every single day. You enter into a state. Uh, you, are, you have an awareness to, to your own uh, ig uh, ignorance, really, uh, because it's pervasive so bad. Um, the, if you look back at even uh, science, I think science is the biggest, uh, one of the biggest parts of this. Most of our deep space things that we're being told is mind control. When they come back and tell us that it rains diamonds on Neptune, and the person who told us that is NASA astrobiologist Lynn de Rothschild, you need to understand that we are looking at a system where people are injecting ideas into our mind, number one, experimentally, but number two, on purpose to present a, an all-encompassing, all-powerful handle over all things that you could never handle yourself. So when they're telling you that, hey, 550 million light years away, we've taken a picture of a black hole, and they say that a month after they have to finally admit, well, actually the moon is inside of Earth's atmosphere. It really starts to uh, expose just how deep this goes. And, and to illustrate, I want all of it, hopefully most of your your listeners don't watch a show called NCIS because maybe you've already understood what it is. And if that's true, I want to encourage you to watch that show. Because when you turn that show on and watch, you're going to see that there's an ever-present uh, uh, pushing of authority, mm -hmm. of we know what we're doing, mm -hmm. of justice. Just of, call no the matter, cops, you know, yeah. we got a problem, call the cops. Exactly. Oh, they know exactly what to do, they're professionals. Meanwhile, they're showing satellite <laughs> images of a satellite that's hunting down one bad guy, you know, in the parking lot. And he's <laughs> gonna get him to save that girl, by gosh, because that's that's what we do. <laughs> and so it, it, if you start to piece together, well, how would that work on a mind control? You, you really understand why it's there. You actually understand now. So this is why five corporations want to run television. This is why they want to run news. It, the, this isn't because they want to have fun. This isn't because they want to make money. This is how you control a populace. You have to numb them into this feeling of security. So I want to just put forward to everyone, you don't have to believe this, but just pretend like you can for a moment. Satellites aren't real. Like just take that just for a moment and pretend like satellites aren't real. Now, first of all, I, just to uh, ease everyone, we've been doing GPS since World War I. So GPS would still work, it's, it's okay. <laughs> in fact, your uh, satellite dish receiver would still receive the same signal because it would be received just like a ham radio signal would. But just bear with me here because if satellites aren't real, why are they telling you about satellites? Like if you think about that, now you have this NASA, this space agency that is painting pictures for you and they're painting pictures of for you and they're telling you that they're real. And because of that, you have this sense of, my God, we've got it all figured out. Like we, we are orbiting 10,000 satellites above the earth and none of them ever break. And every one of them works every time. And none and of them just, can ever and, take a picture of the whole earth. It's, it's Exactly. <laughs> so you, but, but imagine what that does emotionally. Do you see what I mean? Right. Like if you follow it from the mind control standpoint, you start to understand, wait a minute, there's an, a big emotional hook when someone tells me it rains diamonds on Neptune, I think that's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. <laughs> that's all I've ever wanted was a diamond, and it's raining <laughs> diamonds on Neptune right now. It, it, it's a, an archetypal hypnotic trance, the exact same kind of trance when they tell you, hey, if you sign your name like I did and enlist in the Navy and you promise to follow orders, if you just do what you're told with no question, we're gonna call that patriotic and we're gonna thank you for your service. And throughout the rest of the day, no matter what, is whenever you turn on the TV, you're gonna see someone on NCIS or some other show that's gonna say, my God, he's a patriot. And that's really all that mattered. And you start to feel this emotional mind control overcoming you and that's where you really have to kind of check yourself and go, science isn't real. I'm not saying science isn't real, guys. I'm saying that science is constantly injected with mind control. 
everything is. And I pick science right now because I'm trying to pick like one thing that I think your, your users could, could relate to. My book actually points to 47 different things, 47 different parts of your life that show you here's where mind control came in that maybe you didn't necessarily notice it. Yeah. I, I also define the three steps of mind control. I, I can go into those now, but you might have a follow up or something. I, I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> well, I'm enjoying it. Like you, this is exactly you're so on my wavelength uh, and you're down the road farther than me on many things. So I, I'm moving your book up to close to the top of my reading <laughs> list you. because this is exactly uh, you talk about, you know, satellites. All this. When I saw that black hole photo, I just totally just uh, these photos from NASA. Like, I can't believe people think they're real. Like that yeah. they're they're obviously paintings. <laughs> like, it's so like, bad. Like it's just it's like so a street bad. artist painting, and people yeah. are like, "Wow, yeah." So we're so lucky that you know we know everything about the universe now, and I'm just going to keep paying my taxes and thank goodness for NASA and the troops. <laughs> you know, so, That's exactly it. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but uh, I never fell for a lot of that stuff. I fell for some of it, but uh, a lot of the programming I missed, and I I'm not sure why. I I didn't go to school a lot. I I was basically I'd never go unless they made me, and then mm -hmm. I'd sit in the back and I listen to the horse race reports in like grade seven and go to the track and bet horses and stuff. Uh, and then when I, went, when I went home, I rarely watched TV because I was a computer nerd. And I, even back when I was like 12, uh, uh, it was just Apple II Pluses and things like that back in 1980. But I never watched the television. So I think between not going to the schools and not watching the television programming, I didn't get a lot of this programming. So a lot of my life, I'm just like, well, I can't believe people believe this stuff. Like, it's so strange. But but a lot of people do. And, and it's it's on purpose. So, you know, just carry on. It's so fascinating to me. Well, one of the ways they really get you is once they get you uh, suckling on an archetype, it becomes impossible for you to pull your lips away. You, you, were, you were drinking that teat now. Uh, as an example, I'm gonna say Einstein. People love Einstein. They think, oh, he's this brilliant, brilliant guy. And, and that's great. I, I don't wanna take away anyone's ability to draw power from Einstein. You know, you've got your favorite quote, you've got a poster on your wall. The purpose of that archetype <laughs> is to allow you to feel comfort to draw power from it. It's a sigil, it's a human sigil though. So if you picture what Einstein does, and then you picture what it's like to come to the truth, you'll notice that in 1905, uh, special relativity was already uh, bunked. It, it was already debunked. There was at least 100 scientists wrote going, why, why are you saying this? Like, what are you talking about? And, and it was you know, the proof of that the ether actually does exist, even though uh, here we have this new idea of special relativity that can only prove, only disprove it if you accepted the math, if you accepted the theoretical parts of it. So you look at something like that and you you start to go, well, why why would they lie like so deeply about that? But then you that's when I go deep into alchemy. That's when I start to look into my own power. Uh, uh, society hides our body's true power behind the word placebo. We have this word placebo, mm -hmm. but <laughs> what we really have is we have these bodies that are just freaking powerhouse ninja badasses. <laughs> but we're told every day, no, no, no. You, you only get this, you only get this. Uh, take, for example, a white powdered pill versus a leaf. Right now, because of mind control, if I offer you a leaf and I offer you a white powder pill and you, you have a, a, uh, a, an ulcer, an actual ulcer in your stomach, the white powder pill would be twice as effective as that leaf would be, like twice. It, you have a mental construct that you can create when you're taking medicine. You're taught that healing comes from outside myself. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I must be given a pill. And if I take a pill, a pill is more powerful than a leaf. Why? Because of NCIS, because of all the news, because of all the TV that tells me that pills are more effective. But it goes even deeper. This is all covered in the book. But what's more powerful than a white powder pill is a capsule. A capsule actually has like a 20% increase in value of placebo effect. What's more valuable than a capsule is a capsule taken twice a day. <laughs> What's more powerful than that is if it's two-toned. What's more powerful than that is if it has a letter stamped on the capsule, actually has an effect on the placebo effect. <laughs> now we're getting into whether or not it's a male or a female who's giving you the medicine. 
how old they are. If they're wearing a white ceremonial voodoo robe, I, I'm sorry, I mean a doctor's coat. If they're holding a clipboard. butcher jacket, but yeah. It, it, yeah, a butcher jacket's a great, it, it's all of these things, even the marketing of the box, the, the slick, whether or not the box is, is slippery, like whether or not it has a shine to it versus if it's dull, all of these are factors in what we're doing as medicine right now. Right now, we come out with new drugs, and when they experiment with them, uh, they'll see that, that this drug is 55% effective. But then they'll notice that it's 48% effective if you eliminate the placebo effect, which means that they're selling you a drug that is 7% effective. That's it. However, the mind control is already there. Meanwhile, all of us already have this power in our body. But we've been told you're not allowed to exercise the power in your body until you're given a pill, until you're given this medicine. Yeah. And it, it keeps going up. Above the pill is a syringe. That's actually even more effective. But then you start to look at vaccines. So it, it's complete mind control everywhere. And it's so deep. The reason why it's so deep and effective is because of how painful it is to see it. It is completely an emotional, painful event. Maybe not for you because it sounds like you've been out of it for a while. But if you've grown I got up excited in this system, every time that I find out I was, I've been fooled like big time. But uh, I, apparently a lot of people, it really hurts them. I, I don't understand it myself. Well, because they're, I think it's because they're, this is why I try and really focus uh, on the emotional uh, part of waking someone up is because um, people identify with something. And so by doing that, they, they equate it with their own identity. They, uh, they, what they have is they have a vacuous solar plexus. They're, they're, they mistake it for hunger. But because there's a vacuum here, um, when they see something else that reflects, makes them feel good, they identify with it. They're, they're giving their awareness uh, to that archetype. So if I do that to Einstein growing up, and then I watch a podcast and someone says, well, Einstein was a fraud, it hurts me. Because I identified with that, and uh, that's part of why the dependency you feel system. Because yeah, yeah, right. The opposite of self supremacy. Do you see? That's why they shame self supremacy because they 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 know that you're going to feed. You're going to have to feed off something. If you can't believe in yourself, you're going to pick Hulk Hogan, or if you're not into society right now, you're going to pick the dastardly Destardo, the other guy. It, it's it doesn't matter which one you pick. The point is, is that you've evacuated yourself and now they've got that fish hook that's in your in your assemblage point. This is something Carlos Castaneda talks about. It's, it's your your imagine the center of your awareness like a needle on a record. That assemblage point, when it's pulled out of the body, that's what makes you a slave. It has nothing to do with chains. It's all about where that assemblage point lies. So interesting, uh, man. I'm so glad that I, I contacted you, um, and I'm so reading your book. Um, I've got a question, but I actually want to bring up one thing about the placebo effect. So for people out there watching right now uh, who, there's a lot of, uh, what is it uh, when you, you're more like scientific thinking? Is that the right brain or left brain? I forget which one they call it. Do you know? Well, scientific is such a, right brain's or, more creative. Okay, left the, the non-creative side analytical. then, like the more like, you know, analytical, you, yeah. analytical, all that sort of stuff. So left brain. So there's a lot of left yeah. brain people out there. And um, and when they hear like conspiracy theories or uh, that you've been brainwashed or these sort of things, yeah. uh, a lot of them are kind of like, well, that can't be true because I read in a book in school and blah, blah. <laughs> you know, it's like a stupid. But anyway, hey, no offense. Uh, we're waking you up, though. It's really good. And um uh, so here's one example of, uh, for people out there who might be a little bit more like that. And you're kind of like, I'm not sure about all this stuff. These guys are kind of crazy. Look at the placebo effect. So now if I say to you, and I've said this personally, because I've actually done all this stuff personally with my own health stuff, that your body can heal itself. Your mind and body can heal itself. It doesn't need anything outside of it to heal itself from anything. Um, a lot of people will say that's crazy. Well, look at the placebo effects. Actually, the, the most studied uh, thing in science, I think, ever is the placebo effect, because every yeah. single time they come out with one of these pills, they have to do the placebo effect to mm -hmm. show that the pill kind of works, because it, it works a bit more than the placebo effect. 
effect every time. Um, but the placebo effect actually works. It's actually the most studied thing ever. So if, if you're sitting out there and you think Jeff's crazy, he thinks you can heal yourself, um, just realize that this has actually been documented. If you're more left brain, this has been scientifically documented as fact more than anything else in the entire mm-hmm. history of the world that this is a fact. And if you're left brain and you think that I'm crazy for saying it, but I just told you, and you can look this up in two seconds, that that this has been scientifically documented thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of times, uh, and you still can't uh, accept that that might be possible, you're brainwashed. And now don't get scared, don't get mad, just like uh, you were saying, like some people get really angry when they find out they've been fooled or whatever. Don't, be like me, be really excited because this is gonna open up a whole new world to you. You don't need to be a slave to all those pills anymore uh, and that sort of thing. So. Uh, incredibly fascinating. So I have a, a bit of a question about, um, you know, where did all this stuff come from? Like, uh, I don't know if this is in your book or not, but like, you know, when we talk about like the people who are doing this stuff and, and yeah. you know, we call them the elites or the Zionists or the uh, uh, Jesuits or the Masons or Illuminati and there's different words and different mm-hmm. uh, secret societies and all that kind of stuff. But it always comes down to with me, like, who are these people and where did they come from and how have they been doing it for for this long like yeah. and how are they this smart to be doing this stuff do you have theories on that or is, do you talk about yeah. any of that anybody? okay give me your, your theory on that yeah it's this dick named carl he lives about two miles <laughs> where down the heck here? is carl i'm pissed <laughs> carl you me, man you're screwing up the whole world for no reason <laughs> no uh I, I, what i've done is uh, in my research I, i've gone back to egypt to the land of Kemet, which is the literally means black, the land of black. And I've just looked at, at what was happening back then. If you can imagine um, the city of Heliopolis, which is a city about 20 miles north of, of the Great Pyramids, was surrounded in all these obelisks. And these obelisks were, were dipped in electrum. They were just like serious uh, power centers back then and I, this was like 13,000 years ago I mean it wasn't that far but I'm talking about we're talking about ancient civilization here I'm talking about things were done differently back then and if you look at at, at the stability of Egypt prior to you know in, in the BC times you have like three dynasties that were that were pretty just well done they, they lasted a long time and then we compare them to say Alexander you know we would say oh Alexander the Great he made it like 20 years like that was it you know and then everything he did fell apart he was pushing a coercive system without mind control in egypt they were pushing something much different it was they didn't need coercion they didn't need compassion uh they were just using mind control and back then this was much more about ritual and much more about belief and what I've done is actually it's not in this book, but if but if anyone wants to follow my column, I've written about these needles and specifically Cleopatra and Julius Caesar Caesar. And I've explained how their ruling was very different. Cleopatra, although not even technically from Egypt, um, was beloved. She was a beloved leader. It was she was followed because of the mind control, whereas in Rome, uh, Julius was a leader because of force, because he was able to physically coerce someone into doing that. So if you really want to trace how the mind control happens, you need to look back when it was working so well, what was making it happen so well. And back then you have the city of Heliopolis, you have Thutmose, you have uh, the story of Moses. You have all these people that are back there that would wake up with the sun. Imagine a sunrise ceremony. And before the sun comes up, a pharaoh steps out onto the balcony and all of these slaves, mind control people, are willingly, their dopamine is, is like, yeah, I'm going to go watch the Pharaoh rise the sun. It's the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> and the Pharaoh would come out and raise his palm. And by raising his palm, the sun would come up. Every, every step he made, every word he said, every ritual he participated in was the pinnacle of mind control. It was about establishing this system of uh, massive dominance. That's where we got the first circumcision that you can find actually goes back to Egypt. And the first time that that started off as a ritual is these guys were like 13 years old. The young Pharaoh would step up and he would be ready to take power. And by 13, he would come down and place his song on the table and just chop the, chop the end of it off to show his people, here's how much of a man I am. So now he's injected, this is what's called trauma, 
programming, and, and I write extensively about this because this is actually how it works. Um, but this is the first trauma program where he's showing everyone, do this to be like Pharaoh, uh, chop off the end. This is like gelding a horse. Uh, but when you do that to a man, you're completely uh, uh, disrupting their entire essence, um, their ability to develop through trauma programming. That's why we kill JFK. That's why we have 9-11. That's, these are trauma programs. If we didn't have these, they would lose control over us because we would naturally fall out of resonance. But when you've introduced trauma, you, you can now teach. I want to give one quick example to explain exactly what I mean. Uh, imagine a child is playing with a, a fork and he's approaching a light socket. A trauma program is built into all of us. We, we know how to do this. We know what works. Imagine what that mother might do. She might rush over there instantly and just freak out, right? Because she's seeing their child about to stick a fork in a light socket. The first thing she does uh, is she's going to jolt the child in some way. Uh, when I was a kid, they would spank me. But in today's world, if you don't spank whatever, I don't want to lose you. You might get a jolt. You might get someone who like touches you really fast, like you would do a dog or, or correct something. What you've done is you've, you've introduced a state now someone's in a state of mind of, oh, uh, oh God, oh God, something's bad, something's bad. Okay, so that's the trauma. The second you do that, they have now entered into a voodoo trance. They are hypnotically suggestible right now. And because of that, you're able to then insert your program. That's why it's trauma programming. So in this case, it would be, John Jacob Jingle, don't you ever stick a fork in that you know thing again. Don't you ever do that. And now that child forever remembers the adrenaline and the awareness that was inside of their endocrine system when that happened. Because when you raise the level up like that really quick, you're opening up every pore in your body. And when every pore opens, what you really have happening is you're fully conscious. You are completely in the moment and you're conscious. And that's when the trauma programming works. That's why at Parkland, they, they did what they did with the Parkland shooting and with 17. You introduce trauma, this wasn't, I was going down to the UPS and shooting a bunch of adults. No, we have to shoot children. Because if you shoot children, it makes the trauma. People are like freaking out. They're like, we need government. We need government. That's why these are just going to keep happening. It doesn't matter if it's left or right. It's not even about the cabal. This is just how you run sheep. This is any any herder. This is how he would do it. If, if a sheep goes too close to the apple tree, bam, you gotta, you gotta tag him. You gotta, you gotta make it hard. You gotta make that painful. Then you introduce the program and you don't even have to do that to all of them. You do it to one, the rest follow, man. They're happy to, they just, they just wanna get along. Because again, it's not about loyalty to truth. It's about loyalty to comfort. That's what we are as a society. We're loyal to our comfort level. We're loyal to our trance. We're not loyal to our freedom or each other. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> I could talk for hours about this, but uh, uh, try to keep these a little bit shorter. Um, maybe one sort of final question, although I probably come up with a few others after this. But um, so basically, what you're saying here is what I believe as well that almost the entire world is mind controlled. And um, you know, uh, do you have any thoughts on? Can we wake these people up? Yeah. Should we wake these people up? That's a, you know, I, I sometimes hang out with some interesting characters at some interesting places. And sometimes I wonder if they're like major Illuminati people that kind of like come talk to me about cryptocurrencies or something. And, and I'll bring up, you know, how all this stuff they do is all crazy. And they'll be like, well, you know, sometimes we, they, it's good to do these sort of things. If they didn't do these things, you know, these people would get out of control and, you know, we have to do these sort of things. And, 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 um, you kind of almost get the sense, like, even the people who are doing this, they think they're doing the right thing. Like, yeah. they think that, that this is necessary for us to have a decent world. So what's your thoughts on that? Like, uh, for, can we wake people up from this? Should we wake people up? Or should we just allow them to continue to be sheep? And we just ourselves just learn how to deal with being around mostly yeah. brainwashed people. So in my book, I wrote about the satanic ritual of 9-11. And I basically explained that, that Rockefeller planned this whole thing from a very young age, uh, when he gave the land to the United Nations and to the, the Twin Towers. Uh, the Twin Towers were aluminum. They were completely sheathed in metal and they were hollow. They, you know, they had a hollow core. And this is a uh, tuning fork. And this tuning fork is placed inside the Masonic circle. Uh, Masons really are all about checkerboards. 
So the island of Manhattan with its grid of streets is his checkerboard. And his circle of ritual is the water that wraps around Manhattan Island. And so imagine being this evil magi that's Rockefeller. He, his name's David. He believes he is the embodiment of the Star of David. He believes that he is the incarnate um, one, the archetype. And everyone in the world agrees because they've given him all the money. We've created this person. We made him. We expect him to do things like this. He has no interest in money. He has all the money in the world. He wants things that are scarce. He wants things that are that are special. He's he's going to value experiences more than anything else. So from the from his early days when he consecrated the land, he's every day he's thinking about it and he's probably being like sexually aroused by it about I'm going to freaking kill a lot of people one day and I'm going to plant this seed in Manhattan and I'm going to have terror happen inside, what would you do with a tuning fork? When you strike it, you're, you're introducing trauma to the tuning fork. You're introducing a vibration. And that vibration rings. And whatever it touches rings with it. So imagine Manhattan, the entire island is ringing trauma. It's ringing this giant pillage event where everyone in the world was invited. Hey, come, we're going to have an old-fashioned pillage. It's the perfect... Uh, stair step for him to take the title of Satan. Satan's not an entity. It's a title. It's a, it's a goal. And each of these people are competing to be the embodiment of Satan. This is because they understand how archetypes work. Um, I might really want to imbue the archetype of, say, Gandalf or uh, a Robin Hood. Uh, some people might really want the archetype of, you know, of a mermaid or of Poseidon. What I mean is, is that these archetypes are real and these people understand that. And that's why consent is so colossally important to them because when they have your consent, they have your energy. The silver that you pay to kill another human being, even though it's the tiniest, tiniest sliver compared to 250 million others also giving it a sliver, you're still giving it the sliver. That's why... Uh, it's actually probably why Planned Parenthood is funded by the government. It wouldn't need to be, but they want as many people consenting into these different rituals as they possibly can. Because if you give them your consent, you're imbuing the archetype and you're allowing them to step into that power seat and take it. Meanwhile, they're shaming words like white power. I mean, it sounds gross, but if you think about it, what is white? Like you could argue that light is white and light is truth. So the truth of power, we're shaming. We're saying white power is bad, supremacy is bad, prejudice is bad. What they're trying to do is keep us away from the power of archetypes. That's why they're replacing them with product names. You know, They don't want you to associate Zeus uh, with the figure of Zeus. They want it to be Zeus the, the, uh, the diaper for adult, you know, for adult incontinence. It, they're gonna replace everything they can to get you to not imbue your own power and symbolism is how we do that. So all of this is scientific to them. It, th none of this is about being hootie guri. This is all about, look, man, I want the best results out of my engine. And if I'm going to put, you know, some good fuel in my engine, I'm going to be able to really take off. They simply understand how the world works, and we don't. That's why they're successful at it. That's why they'll always be successful at it. And that's why they want us to be so ashamed of finding our own power. Because the moment we did, it, they can't compete for that archetype if our prana is invested in our own system. If we're pulling out of our own power, what it means to imbue the rebel flag, for example, or e even the United States flag. Um, this is all about energy and, and how they can siphon it. I knew I was going to have at least one more question. <laughs> this is the by far the deepest of them all. Uh, I don't even know if you have an answer for it, but like, what is it that these people are trying to do? Like, uh, <laughs> like, uh, um, well, like, just, like, let me just say a couple more things so you can kind of see where I'm coming from. But like, 
like what do you have thoughts on like what life is for example like do we yeah. just have one life and all that kind of stuff like 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 for me personally if you said to me um you could be the richest man in the world uh and you can control everybody and you can uh at the snap your fingers and millions of people will be dead uh i'd be like i have no interest like that does not interest it just totally doesn't um <laughs> like it's just not interesting to me like what is it about these people that they want that kind of stuff and what is sort of the end game of it all i don't think that most elites actually have free will um I, i'm gonna i write about gloria vanderbilt as a good example anderson cooper is the son of gloria vanderbilt anderson cooper is the tv host for cnn um anderson cooper is a uh, a satanic rooster um i don't say that disparagingly i mean his role in life is to uh, repeat the Morning Star. This is the Gannett Publishing News. This is what the AP and Reuters puts out every day. He is there to crow. He's pretending to be the truth. This is what Venus does when it rises first before the sun. It's pretending to be the sun. This is what uh, Satanism or Luciferianism really is all about. So Anderson Cooper has taken that role of archetype. He doesn't actually have free choice. That's why he's he's a multimillionaire and he's he's humiliating himself on a news network that's, you know, has a pretty shitty reputation. In fact, you know, you imagine these pictures where he's climbing down into the he's pretending like he's underwater. Right. <laughs> Even though he's like in one foot of water, it's here's the richest man in the world who's a slave. He's a slave because he's been trained from dopamine from a very, very young age. The same as Gloria Vanderbilt. Gloria Vanderbilt, if you look at her art, if you look at anything she does, the, the woman is nuts. She's splintered. All of her artwork is, features these splintered, crazy things, and it, it dictates that same kind of thing. So these elite bloodlines, they're actually trauma programmed, and they don't actually have such of a choice about what they do. Um, this is kind of a deeper topic to get into, but I'll just say really Man, quick. Yeah, we could go on for evil, hours here. Evil is, is uh, I believe that that evil is a necessary tool for why we are all here. That in a sense, all of us are born, or not even necessarily born, but all of us are, are, are rusty. We have, we have iron inside of us, but it's not fully cleansed. It's able to rust quickly. This is what it means when we give our consent too quickly. We, we grow up and we fall for the false belief of, I'm going to join the, the military, like my dad, my, my, my biological father. He was a Marine, and he fell for that trick. The alchemy of his life is about turning what's rusty into stainless. He's becoming stainless. And how he does that is we're all here to learn mm -hmm. how to own every single molecule that's in our body. We're here to own even the follicles of our hair that fall off of our hair, we, we, we take ownership of that. And we lose ownership by giving our consent away. We lose ownership by, by allowing our trust to be evacuated from us while we sleep. We are here to learn how to stop making that happen. So in a sense, God is making super soldiers out of us alchemically. He's requiring each of us come down with our cranial spinal fluid, he, you know, we're an antenna. In fact, we're a, an electrical antenna because the center of the spine is hollow. So it just like a capacitor has a, a positive and then there's a, uh, something separating it. Then you have a negative. It's the power of a battery. We're the same way. So we're rendering these decisions, you know, every second after every second, we get to be hopefully 80 years old and then we die. That rendered decision, that's a crystalline solution. And that solution is very important. That's why DNA passes itself down epigenetically, you know, through epigenetic trauma or through epigenetic wisdom. We're, we're able to learn from our past mistakes and hopefully uh, turn into something that's stainless. This is why I think all these evil people out there sleep at night because they're under the impression that this is exactly God wants them to do this, that, that God wants them to treat us like crap until we will finally say, I'm not taking this crap anymore. And yet you have to admit, we take a lot of crap, man. I mean, we want more and more crap all the time. It's really hard to, to convince people they don't have to eat shit anymore. <laughs> 
Yeah, you, we're so on the same wavelength. I, I, I'm so glad I trust my instincts. Like when someone sent me this article, it's from a guy who I kind of like, I, I pay attention. I'm like, he knows something. And he sent it to me and it was your article. As soon as I read it, I'm like, you know something I, I, I don't know. And uh, and uh, we're so on the same wavelength. So I just immediately, like I, I said at the start of this program, I'm like, I don't know much about you, but I have a feeling we're on the same page. And man, we're so on the same page. And yeah, I kind of like, uh, I kind of think life is kind of like this 3D video game sort of thing that we're put in to, to as you say, learn or, or whatever. And it seems like a mix of like the Truman Show with the Matrix mm -hmm. and, and maybe yeah. these bad guys, you have to have bad guys, right? If everyone was good, there'd be, you know, there'd be no yin and yang. You wouldn't even know mm -hmm. what's good, right? So they're just playing their parts or whatever. Um, it's fascinating. And we could, you know, probably should have you back on again. And in fact, uh, I don't know if you know about our, our conversation for in Arcapoco, but uh, we're going yeah, into the sixth one coming up, and uh, I'd love it if you, if you would speak at it because you're so on the same uh, uh, wavelength as me. We can talk about that afterwards or whatever. It's coming up next February, so we still have 10 months to figure it out. But uh, yeah, man, like we're on the same wavelength. I should have you back on if you want to be back on the show. I try to keep these to an hour or less because people have got ADD nowadays and they got sure. lots of things to do. They've got to run around and pay all those taxes and listen to all the <laughs> exactly. things they're supposed to do yep. and <laughs> from their mind yeah. control. I, but I don't think we finally answered the 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 question I had about uh, can we wake people up and should we wake people up? And maybe you can keep this answer a bit short, but what's your opinion yeah. on that? Like, can we even wake them up? And even if we can, yeah. should we? Because if, if this is all part of the learning, like, you know, I've heard this from very wise people. They're like, if you know way more than someone else, you don't just tell them they have to learn it on their own sort of a thing. So what's, what's your take on that? Well, I, I would normally say that works, but we're living in a, in a, a psychological prison where we're surrounded by psychopaths. So, <laughs> You have to do something. It, you know, it, we're not playing on a play on a fair field, mm. so it doesn't make sense for me to allow the zombies to multiply, because that's really what's happening. So my technique, which I'm still I'm still perfecting, of course, um, but I don't I don't want to try and reach anyone intellectually. Uh, I, I I have to do this emotionally. That's why I put so much effort into my writing. Uh, I call it pulp nonfiction. I, I really <laughs> try and just tell you the truth, but in such a rich way to where you understand what's really happening. I believe that we can wake people up if 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 we make it uncomfortable for them to stay asleep. That that's the key. You're going to have to use the crook and flail on them just as you do on anyone else. <laughs> and I've noticed that the key to that is actually you, you can't really wake someone up directly. Uh, as an example, real quick, a, a friend of mine just asked me this the other day, how do I wake up my husband? And I say, you're not gonna be able to wake him up, but both of you could wake someone else up. And then you could wake someone else up again. If you keep waking other people up in front of him, he's going to see how much more comfortable it would be if he had his own epiphany. And that's the only way it's going to happen. It, you're not going to be able to say, hey, if you get up and do 10 push-ups every day, I promise you're going to be awakened now and everything's going to be better. That person doesn't have enough incentive to get up and start doing push-ups because you're not telling them you're going to make your body better. You're telling them, I'm going to make your life worse because I'm going to show you what mind control is. You're never going to be able to talk someone into doing that. You're going to have to show them the benefits, show them how shameful it is to be someone that's asleep. Show them how, how, how assaulting it is to God, like whatever your version of God is, to be walking through this life asleep, shaming yourself, pretending that you live in an endless vacuum that's ever growing. And you're a pond scum that learned how to have sex with a fish, that learned how to have <laughs> sex with a monkey. And your carbon footprint's the dirtiest thing on the planet. <laughs> Meanwhile, you, you freaking, you exhale life. You exhale what trees breathe. You were, you were so much more, we are the blue whales of land. Like when, if you were in the ocean, you were to see a blue whale, you'd be like, holy shit, look at that. That's what we are. But we've been told we're not. We've been told we're, we're foreign, that we're some kind of cancer that happens in the land here. And we're here to tear it up. This is all mind control. And that's why you have to emotionally convince somebody, hey, this is gonna be hard. You, to wake up is gonna be hard. But I mean, at the end of it, you're going to be a walking magi. You're going to be this dude that walks around imbued with, man, I freaking love being human. I'm fully immersed. 
in my humanity, you know? My toes are fully sunk. My energy is pushed into the tips of my fingers as if I was wearing a glove. I'm completely inside my body. That's the only way that people are gonna wake up. I don't think that they would have a choice if they, if they were fully seated in their body, they fully felt their pelvis as their throne and their skull as their crown. They would fully wake up anyway. You wouldn't have to do anything. It just would be a necessary function of being inside your body. Very interesting and uh, very similar to my thoughts as well. When I even started this podcast, it was about just like making anarchy or freedom like a normal thing, uh, just trying to make it look kind of cool, uh, you know, like yeah, like, yeah. like it's not what you th thought it was sort of a thing. And then I, I went on to say, you know, if we can get enough of us, pretty, all we really need is at every cocktail party in the world, there's at least two out of 10 people kind of understand what we're talking about. So when one guy brings up, he's like, I sure love to pay taxes. One guy go, you're a complete and total idiot. And, yeah. and uh, just, everyone always looks for like social, like uh, whatever. So that guy will look at the other eight people and go, is, is he right about that? And if one other guy goes, yeah, he's totally right. You're an idiot. Then that guy will actually have to start thinking. Uh, so yeah. so it's like just making it more normalized, uh, uh, leading by example, as well as you pointed out with the sort of the husband sort of a thing. It's mm -hmm. like you can't really change him. But if you change people in front of him, he'll start to see that, oh, man, that guy wasn't doing so good. Now look at him. He's, he's living a great life. And he got caught on to this thing that my wife's talking about. Maybe I should look into it and stuff like that. Yeah, so exactly. very similar sort of a thing. Very, very interesting. So glad to have you on. Um, I hope I have you back on again sometime. I'm sure there's so many topics we could we could cover. Uh, hopefully you'll come down and speak in Narcopoco next year. And uh, please finish up with anything you want to mention, if you want to mention your website, books, or any other topic that we didn't discuss that you want to just mention. Uh, yeah, thanks. I, I, I First of all, I, I it's like really was uh, awesome that you contacted me. I've been a big fan of your work for a long time. So um, I can't tell you how much it means for me to, to, to be on here. I've, I've always thought your approach is similar. This is how we're going to do it. We just have to make it attractive to live a different kind of lifestyle. So I just want to say thanks. I really appreciate this. I'd, I'd love to come back. Uh, secondly, I work with other brilliant minds. Uh, they subscribe to my mailing list, but also they're on Twitter. Uh, I just have this core group of friends that are just really into alchemy. And I can't stress enough how important they've been to me on my journey. I would imagine that most people listening out there have a similar experience. That what really helps is when you can form a campfire where you can, you can find, find other people that are searching for the truth just like you are. I, I just I can't stress how thankful I am for all the people uh, in my community that that you know guide me and tell me things. Um, it, to me, it's the ultimate alchemy is when you're doing it in a group form. And with that, I just invite anyone, please, you know, uh, get in touch with me on my website jtrue.com. You, you can find my uh, uh, you can subscribe there to my mailing list. Uh, this is my book, Blueprints of Mind Control. I it's got a lot of topics in here. It's not a long read in the sense of you can really jump to chapter 36 and just read that. You'll, you'll find it's an essay in, in, an, in and of itself. So it's not like even a linear thing because I understand how busy we all are. Um, but, but give it a try. I, I'm trying to ingest. I'm trying to create more books that do exactly this. Uh, it, it's a kind of an emotional uh, pill. I don't even know what color this pill is, actually, because it's not a black pill. It's not a red pill. It's something much different, and uh, so I don't know what the color is. But anyway, uh, let's keep growing, man. Let's let's keep spreading this message. Let let's let's get better. Let's be better humans. Yeah, I think we are. Uh, I think there's so many people. Like I just see that the roses blooming now. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, like 10, 20 years ago, there was hardly any of us, and now I there's people like yourself I didn't even know about, and you're doing amazing work. And I just found out about you, and there's probably hundreds of other people doing amazing stuff, and they're all similar to you. They're like, I'm gonna do this to try to help the world, to help people wake up, and and stuff like that. And uh, so yeah, I think there's there's a lot more going on than than most people know about, and I think those people who control the world, I think they're getting pretty scared. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. and good, because they've been scaring the crap out of us for a long time. It's about time they felt a little scared. Uh, although I don't really like want to see them all killed or anything. I just want to see people mm -hmm. wake up. And once they wake up, the mind control is over, and those people just go away. They just lose their power um, in, in exactly. various ways. So I think that's really the way. And you brought up uh, how great it is to work with other people. That's, of course, one of the great things about an Arcapoco. So again, hope you can come down. And uh, oh, you know, you hanging out yeah. with people like Mark Passio and Max Egan, I can't even imagine the conversations that 
would go on around the bar uh, with you guys. So so that's great stuff. And for people out there, that's a great thing about Narcopoco. Thousands of people who are all quite like-minded, all talking about these kind of topics. It's, it's pretty great. And then people get ideas and they, they branch off from there. And and that's how things can change, I hope, or whatever. I, I'm almost at the point now, it's like, I'm just enjoying the ride at this point, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to like enjoy my life. And, and I'm actually, I used to treat it like this big war, and now I treat it like a big game or a big movie uh, that I'm a part of. And I just mm-hmm. sort of enjoy the movie as it goes on, and I'm not necessarily connected to the results. Um, you know, if people don't wake up in my lifetime, I'll yeah. be fine. I still, I'm going to be in great shape. I'm going to have a beautiful wife, a great family, great dogs. I'm going to do great things. Uh, and, and if they wake up, awesome. And, and we'll yeah. see what happens after that. So real pleasure, real uh, 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 surprise, uh, surprise of a pleasure to have you on, James. Uh, I, I just sensed as soon as I read your article, I'm like, we, I think we would get along really well. And I think we did. So, so uh, if you didn't, uh, you know, check out his book down below. I'm definitely, I already bought it, but I, I, uh, I have about a hundred books on my Kindle and uh, but I'm going to move this way up into the top 10 of, of books I want to read because this is right up my alley so uh, real pleasure if you like this video please like subscribe share down below because the people who do control the world will definitely try to make sure most people don't see this video so if you do want people to know about this sort of stuff uh, definitely share it and like it and that's it for Anarchast your home for Anarchy on the internet peace love and Anarchy and Narcopoco is so hype, I'm trying to tell ya This the event of the year and best vacation ever Ryan's part of Jeffrey Tucker, just to name a few Get your tickets, you don't want to miss it You should roll through, talking politics to health and self-improvement to invest in So many things, not one thing, learn how to live life unchained, yeah Four days vibing on the beach, time to connect All about growth, way more than a conference This is Anarchopoco, yeah Let's go. You ain't seen nothing yet.